Welcome. This is a July 23rd Jalen Zones production user call. We have Chris, Dave, Daniel, Chokuno, Antoneg, and myself. Uh, let's see. Someone put this on the agenda last week, and uh, it is new to me. So I don't know if they've identified themselves, but let's take a peek at what that is. It is Little Jet. It is in ports. It is, let's zoom in on that. It is an open source, easy to use orchestrator for managing, deploying, scaling, and interconnecting FreeBSD jails anywhere in the world. Ooh, I smell VXLAN or something. Let's take a peek at the GitHub repo. And show of hands, is anyone familiar with this project? Welcome, Antoneg, officially. Shell, Roth, make file. Okay, Little Jet. Do, 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 do. Lots of docs. I love it. Hello. And, and graphics. Hello. Oh, and images. Nicely done. Welcome, Antoneg. So, Antoneg, if you were used it yet, someone dropped it on the Yes, I, yes I used it already. You are now our resident expert. So, how did it treat you? <laughs> Uh, it was okay. I mean, um, uh, overall, the idea is the following. There is the core utility, which is app jail. Okay. Uh, that's used by the author, DTXF, D DTXDM. Fun, then yeah. he created another utility called the director, which is a manager of app jail on a single node. So think of it like Docker and Docker Compose. Like app jail is Docker, director is Docker Compose. And then he created LittleJet, which is more like Docker Swarm, right? So now you're managing a multiple nodes of machines using the director, which is using AppJail. So very basic idea, uh, done it very well. Uh, I personally don't like it. I mean, the syntax specifically, but uh, the implementation itself is very well done, right? Okay. Like it, it, it logs things properly. It... Um, there's a clear separation between an operator and a developer, which is a lot of the other tools don't do right, uh, even on FreeBSD. So like th this is a very well done uh, implementation. And um, also more importantly, uh, the, 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 the app jail uses a syntax called make jail for its uh, Docker file like um, usage. And the make jail syntax is very portable in the sense that you know, if you like grep dash V and trim out uh, <laughs> uh, its internal commands, uh, you get a pretty much a shell script that you can run anywhere else that you want, right? Uh, so that, that's that's very well done, very much nice, yeah, and all, all good. Is yes. that related to the make jail that Dan Langell often talks about? No, that's muck jail. This one is make jail. Okay, got it's it. <laughs> Austria, which yeah. one of you is calling? Okay, I'm going to mute for a second. Uh, go ahead and take a look <laughs> at the resource controls here. Oh, I was going to say that we've also used um, resource control today. Somehow I am convinced my scientists to use a native free BSD jail for um, uh, local operations where there's a piece of software called Kraken, like release the Kraken kind of name, uh, which is for scientific purposes. It classifies and aligns uh, DNA sequences. And um, it, it didn't work very well. Um, rather, it didn't work at all with NFS. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. How is this a problem? And in their documentation, it says, like, if you are using NFS, expect issues. I have no idea why. Like, why would that be a problem? But anyway, I thought, you know what? Uh, maybe I can just create a native jail. Um, instead of a beehive uh, that uses NFS, and then just null FS mount the directories. And then we used um, NICE to run it in the background. Uh, but we ended up actually using a CPU groups to assign a specific CPUs to the jail, and the process was very much straightforward. So, uh, yeah, until, of course, I realized what the problem is with the NFS. I guess we'll be using that native uh, jail. And yeah, that's the longer story short version. And yeah, this also works very well, right? Doing nice dash N uh, in the exec start. Um, the, the, the right way actually of doing this, which it, it takes a lot more work than what um, Stefano did in here, is actually using um, ID Pro, uh, ID Prio and RT Prio which is idle priority and real-time priority. That's the right way of doing it in the sense that it's more manageable. But uh, this is a very simple way of doing it, and it works fine, yes. Is the priority inherited by all processes in the jail, yes. or is it just the jail itself and it kind of throttles somehow, magically? 
No, uh, you basically set the nice to the RC, and because the RC has the niceness, oh, okay. then all of its dependent okay. processes also have niceness. Now, it did. Uh, I do have a question about this, and I forgot to ask Stefano, which is why you should use RT Prio and ID Prio, which is what if I do JExec bin SH into a JL? Now, that is not a, a, a descendant of yeah. uh, RC. What would be the niceness of that? So I have to check that today, uh, or maybe just ask Stefan directly. So th that that's a, that's a very important, uh, you know, because someone might expect that oh, if I run Macworld, make world using JExec, then it will would it also get that or not? So I, I think it doesn't, but I'll, I'll try today and and make sure, and then I'll cool. add to the document. What were the other tools you mentioned? RT Prio and. Uh, RT Prio and ID Prio, they are the ID exact Prio. same tool, just inverse. One of them is real time, the other one is idle. That's the right way of doing scheduling with jails, because in that case, anyone that has a prison ID, whether it's a descendant of RC or yep. executed manually with JXEC, they will get the same permissions. Uh, in our infrastructure, we use a CPU sets. We just used that today, and we're, we're very happy with CPU. Like you, you would run OpenSSL speed test. And it's like, oh, only these CPUs are firing up. No other CPU would ever fire up. Cool. And Rick, how do you set the CPU sets? Uh, do you do that on the uh, on the XX start that you bind it to a, a predefined set, or how do you do this? Not uh, not necessarily. Uh, by the way, the documentation very intensively about that is is in last year's meeting notes. Uh, me and Jan right. stayed like an hour late and and did that. But the long story Back short away, version, uh, yeah. Uh, if if you if you do if you do a JLS name, CPU set dot ID, uh, then you would get the CPU set of a um what's its name of a jail, right? Uh, uh. So uh, uh, let me see. So it would be JLS space name. Which would print the name of the jail mm -hmm. space yep. CPU set dot ID. Dot ID. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, if 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 there is no CPU set ID set, it will sign one. If 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 or you can assign it manually uh, in in the jail conf. You can just say CPU set dot ID equals whatever. Is that is that uh, CPU set space ID uh, space no. dot ID or without the space without the space right? without the space. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah, without right. my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, and now you have the ID now, then you can do uh, the simplest way to do it would be CPU set dash L and then the exact CPUs. For example, you can do uh, six dash seven, right? That would be CPU number six, CPU number seven. Or you can do, um, let's say uh, CPU set dash L, let's say two dash 20. Now you have uh, 20, uh, 18 CPUs, right? So like you, you can choose that. Uh, and then you would pass to it also after the dash L, the CPU numbers, you would pass dash S, the CPU set number. So if your CPU okay. set number is Should, five. Quick question five, here. Five, um, you're, you're talking about cores really, right? Because if you have hyperthread yes. in uh, enabled, then all right, okay, got it. Yes. Yes. Uh, in our case, what we do is we used, there's an XML file. I can't believe it's an XML file inside of sysrc, sorry, sysctl that prints the, 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 the topology. So it would tell you, you have two sockets. Each socket has this many cores. Each, each core has this many threads. It will print the topology in XML for, format. Very useful thing, by the way. Um, and then from there, you can figure out which core is on which socket, where it starts, where it ends, uh, and then you can assign them like that. It's it's very possible XML. I mean, whoever built that, thank you very much. Uh, I think I can even find it. I'll just uh, find that and send it right now. Does it because that was very useful? Does it have the intelligence to distinguish between a a V thread and a hardware core? As far as I remember, yes. But let me just double check. Um, uh, let's see now. You can't rely on the NUMA topo topology. Um, the CPU will lie, the operating system will lie, um, the hardware lies. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all lies. It's, it's all lies. The hardware lies is a problem, yes. Yeah. So the CCTL is the following. I'm yeah. sending it into the chat. It's Perfect. kern. Ah. dot sked dot topology spec. It will print out, and I'm sending the, one of my servers right now. It's a small one because my oh, big one is very large text. There you go. Oh, oh God. God damn you. 
Okay. Zoom is like too many characters. Okay, fine. I'll just print it into just the a document. sample or whatever. Just yeah. Wet our appetite, if you will. Actually, uh, one thing that we I think did not mention with the approach uh, that that is listed here with with the uh, setting the nice value on XX start is that if you use if you use X, uh, JXX to go into the jail. Whatever you launch within GXEC will not uh, yeah. respect that, obviously. Yes, 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 indeed. Yes. So this is a this is a topology. Uh, if you if you look at the top, it will tell you that it has we smaller. Oh, and, sure. And courier. So it will tell you it has count eight numbers go from one to seven, a uh, zero to seven. Um, and that's that's the group level one, and then it has the children, and then okay. there you can see. Uh, that's the first group, uh, that's at level two. And now you can see that the threads are not zero and four, but rather zero and one, right? Zero, one, those are threads on a single core, right? And the next one is two and three. Those are two threads on a single core. Because if you have multiple, or, or AMD, for example, could be different, right? Or it depends on the CPU. For example, on one of my servers, I have 64 cores, 128 threads, but the threads map like this. They go 0, 65, <laughs> mm. right? 1, uh, 66, uh, right? So it's like there's a gap. So it depends on the CPU. So it's better. It's always good to have a look in this uh, to understand the exact uh, grouping, how it's happening. Yeah. Quick question here. Have you checked whether you can, I mean, how can you actually extract whether that is an, an E or a P core? Ah, that's, uh, yeah, yes, <laughs> that's an updated question <laughs> for the modern era. Q. Yeah, because yeah. I, I am, I'm confronted with that question uh, on my on my framework, and I, I think I fixed it, but I'm not completely sure actually. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm waiting for my new generation Intel's because I don't have one yet. And it should arrive soon. And my goal is to basically put all the efficiency cores on the host and mm -hmm. then put all the performance cores for the um what's its name for the beehives and the jails because in beehive you can do dash p and assign a specific cpu mm -hmm. and in jail of course you can use cpu set so that would be my of course i'm not sure how zfs if it would be happy enough to have all the efficiency cores only but yeah that would be a good output to see i if, if any of you has that please run this command and let us know it would be very nice to see the topology of that Yeah, I would expect the um that to be problematic with having the scale. I don't think the scheduler copes very well with that at the moment. P cores and E cores. Yeah, no, there is no idea. Like, like in in the new Max, obviously they they built some things into the scheduler. For example, if you are running a game, then all of the performance cores are assigned to the game, right, and nothing else. Or like if you're watching a video, it depends on the video codec. If it's AV one, it's efficiency cores. If it's E, what was the other one? H E V H E H E C V, whatever it was, uh, then it would use the performance cores because those are more complex to process. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what it is. And Mac OS does that natively and very well. Um, not on FreeBSD, not on any other operating system, as a matter of fact, not even on Windows. Like a lot of uh, Windows people who got the new ARM machines and the new Intel machines, they're very much complaining about this product. Windows is not aware about efficiency and performance cores. Uh, I think we can make it work because we have an integrated system, so to say, compared to Linux and Windows. Um, applications, of course, would be hard, but other than that, um, I mean, from, from a system programming point of view, I don't, um, I don't think that libthread has the idea of, hey, I'm running a thread and this thread needs, I don't know, a performance core. Like there's no API for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if we had an API for that, it would be very nice integration to to say that oh now, okay now I need to put this thread on a performance core rather than yeah so that that would be very interesting to see. Mac OS does though by the way mm. like on on Swift you can you, there's an API for saying which which core you want to be on. Or, cool. Or what we'll type put of that in and what so is this? It? 
Yeah, that's, that's sorry. That, that is me. Um, cool. I just uh, I just okay. ran out of my frame, my framework. Yes, and mm -hmm. this includes this includes P and E course. Um, Ooh, nice. I awesome. cannot tell the difference though, to be honest. Yeah. Someone should add that. I guess that would be handy. So, what's the information about your hardware that the vendor provided? Well, the like thing is, how? I believe that the last the last four cores, I think. No, it's better be. How does this work actually? That's interesting. I was actually expecting that the last four cores would be the um, would be the efficient ones, mm -hmm. but um, I suppose I might be wrong from reading this. How many performance cores did they say, and how many efficiency cores? Yeah, let, let me let me quickly let me quickly uh -huh. I'll look that up. Actually, I don't have that uh... because I'm assuming I'm assuming that eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Which is the last eight cores or eight threads in this in this case? Sorry, the last eight threads would be the efficiency, and the other ones would be the uh, performance. As far, of of course, assuming you have more performance cores. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, obviously the the spec doesn't print out you know E and P, <laughs> but but it this does print different groups, which is good. So that. Thirty-two core ones and um, um, sixty-four, so it doesn't have any. Uh, at least in this model, it doesn't have any different. There's no performance or um, uh, mm -hmm. efficiency cores. They're all the same. But the next, um, I don't know if I still have the ultra details on hand. I did have this somewhere for ultras, and the ultras have a um, physically. It's a single piece of silicon. But inside there's mm -hmm. two sockets, and you and there's uh, some sort of magical bridge in the middle which you can configure um, in the firmware, um, like before boot time. You can configure it whether it's a flat namespace, whether it's um, two sections or four sections. And the um, my understanding is the idea of that was you would decide so how you wanted to carve up your hypervisor to do this, and they were not expecting that you shuttle. Um, large amounts of information across the, uh, the sort of the inter socket bridge, um, and the performance yep. was appallingly bad when we when we tried it. In fact, it was so bad that the ultra CPU, which is like like thirty percent faster than the one I have in my cellar, um, would be slower at building ports than the one in my cellar because um, because moving anything across those that sort of the uh, the intersection was really 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 hard. So um, I just looked it up. It's eight eight efficiency cores, four performance cores. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Is it? Sorry is about that. that. Actually, I just realized there's a German link. I don't know why why Google I, gave me that. I, I don't know. It's fantastic. I don't understand why people are having problems with it. It's perfectly legible to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so are these? <laughs> The or well, one of the two. What's the thing distinguishing them for the untrained eyes here, or is are they still ambiguous and the OS doesn't? I think it's only it? the grouping, really. That the, the way you can here. tell it is only by the groupings. I would expect. Yeah, like oh, he, 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 here you have yes. a grouping of four. Jeez. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's yeah, like those are those approach. are in pairs, but those are in fours, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm guessing. Those would be the performance. Based yeah, on the, one the, the ones at the beginning are the performance. Like, I also exactly. believe so, yeah. yeah. And in the end are the efficiencies. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's the opposite because then the other topologies wouldn't make any sense. Uh, yeah. Naive question. Do both types hyperthread or only one or the other? Yeah, both of them. That's, okay. that's, 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 the, that's the interesting part. We both do it. Yeah. Okay. And it's hyper-threading to four. You know what I mean? Hmm. Like, like historically, oh, we've always yeah. seen hyper-threading to two, okay. but now we're seeing hyper-threading to four yeah. V cores. This is very... It's also sad, because yeah. if there is any kind of a specter meltdown attack again, now you have multiple oh, cores to worry about. Not just yeah, one other. Nice. Oh. <laughs> oh. It wasn't <laughs> complex <laughs> enough already. It wasn't difficult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, who changed my there? I spelled that explicitly. 
Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, the low case. You want the that? No, no, no. It's oh. the, uh, the the word that your spell checker wants to correct. Oh, I yeah. unspellified it uh, because we're we're trying it's to right. it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, the environment. It's okay. I'm surrounded by <laughs> youth. Oh, yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. Oh God. Oh God. Uh, you can yeah, change it back. That's okay. autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> okay anything else on the threading uh uh what's a good word not armageddon this uh uh apocalypse to come because yeah. wow once you yeah. have uh timing issues and, and i i don't even know it's above my pay grade to speculate but wow i i, I know enough that, that, that it, can't go it's well. the cpu's job to speculate <laughs> exactly <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> multi-dimensional <laughs> speculation it's like yeah well i, I well I, I just want to point out in the future yeah. if anyone's also doing hpc on free bsd uh yeah. unfortunately hyper threading is good we've actually seen uh text processing things you know dna sequences and i think they work uh exactly almost twice as fast when it comes to uh enabling because i disabled it initially and I was like, eh, for security reasons. And then I thought, maybe if, let me test. And it was like really much, much, much faster. But it's only about HPC environments when we're talking, you know, hundreds of cores on a single machine. And of course, we're talking text processing specifically. So, yeah. it's What's really uh, interesting with that is you, you get to go a lot faster when the software you're using understands how much um, in particular level one and level two cache there is. And when mm -hmm. it's running inside that cache boundary, then um, if it's using it completely, then hyperthreading makes it worse. And if it's not, then hyperthreading makes it better. And that's basically yeah. it. So anytime someone says, my software works better um, with hyperthreading, I go to them, then you need to rewrite your software. Because um, hyperthreading is by nature extremely inefficient. Let's dump all of our cache, go and do something else, and then we'll dump that cache, and then we'll come back to the thing we were doing. It's enormously wasteful. So um, this is the sort of thing where people are rewriting it in Rust um, or, or, or um, assembly to get exactly the right cache layout makes a huge win. Uh, that's good unfortunately, unfortunately, scientific software is also not in Erlang, because then it would make like really a lot of difference. We, yeah. We've actually seen Erlang and hyperthreading go hand to hand. We've done because everything is immutable, and uh, it actually sets up one one Erlang scheduler per thread, and it does things right. But and scientific people they're stuck in C, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, yeah, po yeah, for Python wrapped wrapping Fortran. Today I saw Perl in scientific software. I'm like, oh. Well, that's interesting. Why are you guys using Perl? And it turns out the command line arguments of the C program was so complex that someone made a Perl wrapper of the command. <laughs> front end to it. I was expecting yeah. he started this work back in the 70s, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on this topic, yeah. I had a great chat with Peter at Ampere on Thursday, and he opened my eyes to the fact that, well, what if you actually have cores to play with, there is no hyper-threading, and then for a storage environment, you give a core per disk, maybe per NIC, a few for the host, and points like their new Max has no L3 cache, but the Ultra does, and you kind of get to chop up your resources in ways that were never possible. So I'm excited, and if anyone has a, a spare Ampere or EMAG or something sitting around, uh, I'll give you a FedEx label. Anything else on cores? I won't make a hardcore joke. Just... So we should we should actually yes. ask someone how you identify this information reliably, like the the PE core stuff because that is interesting. And yeah, there must be a way to do it. Maybe we can maybe we can also patch the uh, the CCTL. Because the CCTL hasn't been touched ever since the PE course came out. Maybe we should have a look into the code and maybe the vendors are uh, sending the information, you know, uh, back to the operating system. 
So th that would be a good idea, I guess. Uh, not my knowledge space, but I would love to have a look around. That would be very interesting. Who, who's responsible for these parts in FreeBSD? Do we have any idea? Yes. So these, what, sorry? These sort of things? It's yeah. Like, uh, um, Mark Johnston and, and Constantin. Um, okay. People in the foundation, I think, people who have swum the deep currents and yes. returned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's also interesting because also UTM, Mac OS's uh, uh, Cameo wrapper, you can also specify uh, either number of cores or exactly which cores or like group of cores. You can say, hey, only pass performance cores or stuff like that, you know? So that also would be interesting to, uh, if someone doesn't have an Intel, they can use Mac OS. Those are very, you know, affordable <laughs> machines to, to do that. Oh, I, asked um, on, I have a point um, there, but go ahead. Shall I? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I asked on IRC and Trinity oh, report cool. back. Uh, um, on the point of Apple Silicon, I was thinking, wow, that's a pretty good machine for those who can't quite afford an Ampere at like 1500 on up. I talked to Kyle Evans last week and he left BSD CAN talking to Mike Carrolls about how to wrap up the proper Apple Silicon support and Mac support. And unfortunately, as we know, poor Mike passed away. That is tragic. Mm -hmm. And so they collectively, everyone truly needs some Apple Silicon developers dedicated to the problem as opposed to just testing because they're far from testing. Um, he outlined the issues such as like no... Uh, ethernet support or whatever i can dig that up if you like mm -hmm. but if someone's interested in seeing uh, apple silicon progress on with freebsd it needs some love it, it's a bit also sadder because the whole thunderbolt thing doesn't work not because you know ethernet uses thunderbolt and thunderbolt is not currently working properly and it, it also got me thinking that if we if someone does fix the Thunderbolt driver issues, that brings a whole new group of users because a lot of people have the old Macs, like 2013 oh, yeah. to 2019. That's a v mm. wide variety uh, of, of machines. And um, the Thunderbolt drivers apparently are compatible. Just the speeds are different, apparently. And the reason why that's interesting is now you have a lot of old laptops that can be used as servers because currently my FreeBSD uh, MacBook is using a 100 meg driver using USB 2, you know. <laughs> uh, but if we had Thunderbolt, we can have gigabit. Also, 10 gig. There, there, there used to be companies who would manufacture 10 gig interfaces, 10 gig Ethernet on, on Thunderbolt. Ah, and it's a, it's a memory diagnostics uh, debugging tool, right? Yes. So, yeah, can uh, be, uh, yes. So I'm going to drop in some comments from Kyle on what has to happen, just so that wisdom is not less. Uh, so it, he says the boot chain is uh, crazy. Uh, okay, I'll drop the whole thing in there. It's not very secret. But the key point is it's not something ready to test. I was hoping to test it for a talk on uh, mm on FreeBSD on ARM in a week or two. But okay, so multi-user, if you can work out the crazy boot chain, there's no NIC and only a few USB ports. Carol's and I were organizing some further work. I'll leave that out. Uh, uh, well, why PCI is broken to get the NIC working. So yeah. Oh, uh, the NVMe is not working? That's interesting. Yeah. Well, Apple That's... has their own thing for storage. Oh, I see. I see. But OpenBSD guys are booting fine, right? Because I heard that they're using the Asahi Linux uh, installation utility, but instead of installing Asahi, it's actually installing OpenBSD. Uh, maybe we can have a look there and learn what they did, at, at least to make the booting part easier. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they fixed other things like Thunderbolt as well as NVMe, but uh, uh, maybe we should ask in their IRC channels or mailing lists. Yeah. It is an, um, a relatively low traffic. I, I follow their um, OpenBSD um, 64 list. There's relatively low traffic in there, but it's the classic thing. Someone has the time and the inclination to do it. Um, yeah. And a little low-level knowledge, but yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, and I think our efforts would be interesting for the Illumos guys now that they have a bootable ARM64 image. Uh, at least there's a complete OmniOS system that's booting uh, on ARM64. Visualized, but there's efforts on to start with the Raspberry Pi. And then, I mean, the, the Mac makes the most sense. Now you have an actual Unix workstation, like we were promised in the 90s, you know? <laughs> Not a PC that's running Unix, but an actual Unix workstation. Yep, with lots of cores to, of different types to play with. So, yes, and I've been encoding these videos with a lowest end M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigs RAM, and it's taken the encoding time from about 40 minutes on average to about eight minutes. So I'm sorry, they're mm -hmm. obliterating PC, GPU, hardware, and mini fronts. Anyway, uh, a quick point from last week's meeting, we discussed... Uh, 9 PFS quite a bit now that it's testable and I've updated the wiki. Please take a peek at the Beehive, I uh, the jail, no, the Beehive wiki. And uh, Doug pointed out a conversation with Warner, Ed Mast listened in. There is indeed a discussion going on and Emil says he will have code soon. So hopefully Emil will join the call shortly and have something to test. Now I... Uh, for those who recall my uh, the broad discussion and conclusion that Vert IO VSOC, while wow, this is more of a Beehive topic, you've mentioned Beehive quite a bit, Vert IO VSOC would be the last interface you ever need. I did run it by Patrick Mooney, and he does not recall mentioning that, and I couldn't find any mention of it in Illumos. But I someone recalls a BeehiveCon where Patrick mentioned working on that or wanting to do that. So if any of you are just dying to make, make uh, Vert IO VSOC happen, I won't stop you. Other news, questions, fun, excitement. Just a quick, while we're talking about 9PFS. Um, yes, please. Do we have both sides now that we can both um, serve and server and client yes. In, yes. in current? Yes. Uh, current in client serve back in like 13, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Doug yes. all those patches. So 9PFS. So yeah, I've, I've got the I've got the link from the wiki already there. I was just wondering is this yeah okay is this usable now? Then I'll I'll start using this in anger. It's, it's very very soon. Oh Daniel, yeah. Daniel probably had to catch a bus or something in Austin downtown New York, but he gave it a try and he wanted to have an isolated jail slash VM slash thing to receive uh questionable ZFS send stream. So it was like, well, what about this? What about Vertio? What would he use? Cons, uh, serial. And uh, he found that that serial interface was really slow. But anyway, there, you can check the reportings for that fun. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I'll just say nine PFS news. OK. Um, and then hopefully that will be complemented with uh, Emil's work. And between those two, we might actually have free, what would we even call it, WSL, Windows subsystem for FreeBSD, where if a FreeBSD guest, for lack of a better term, could be on a Windows system using the built-in WSL, that would be kind of cool. Because I think they've moved, they've been ping-ponging between 9P and VertIOFS and a block device and, and, and. So um, there's that. Uh, I, I've been coding up a storm, but I'll probably share that later in the week or next week, but I've gotten through all my barriers. And uh, word of warning, um, FreeBSD G part destroy dash capital F partition table does not get everything. And I chased some ghosts for quite some time. And I found that you need to like DD off the blocks at the beginning and end of a drive. I noticed that BSD install creates a table, well, I don't know if it does a recover, but it probably should. And then it creates a table and destroys a table and does some acrobatics to properly cleanse a drive. But I found more of this more is necessary and ZFS wasn't happy and I'd get corrupt metadata. And I was like, uh, no, that no shouldn't happen. Anyway, <sighs> I will gladly share my scars in some form. Okay, other topics, exciting news, you name it. Oh, and I sure worked on GPU pass-through, and I'm I'm still hitting walls on that. 
one pro tip is that you may want to also pass through the audio device, which can be tied to your graphics device. But that's Beehive Talk. I'm probably off topic. I'll stop. Uh, Chokuno, do you have any questions for the group? Ideas, wish list items? Cool. No worries. Uh, so, and I know a few folks want to stick around after the call. It is should we should we should we mention your BSD con? That's or coming up. Uh, sure, Mister Beehive Con. Tell us about that. <laughs> um, um, actually, I don't I'm know that that's con this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! No, what it's not that. that bad. Come on, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, September 19 to 22 in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, grab your tickets while they're hot if you yeah, haven't got yeah. one already. Uh, I don't, I don't want to talk about um, where's the tickets? And if anybody on this call wants to come to the Developers Summit, which is the two days prior, where we uh, do much the same as this call, but um, with more authority because there's more of us, um, then um, let me know and I'll hook you up with an invite. About I that. would have loved to do that, but I unfortunately be a already busy booked boy. my flight and it is not for rescheduling, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so uh, Dave, for BSD can they experimented with not requiring invitations. And of course, there was much confusion and there was a moment that only about two people on Earth knew that. But I'd be curious if they are extending that policy to other BSD events. I haven't heard this one. The main thing is usually dealing with food and knowing how many people are coming to things. So oh, that we have I didn't say place. registration. I said invitation. <laughs> Those are oh, very different things. So I it's like, hey. um, and, and maybe inquire because it, it was a welcomed change. And of course, the BSD can Dev Summit is the, a big one. So, <laughs> yeah. I'll have harmonization of that policy on the, on the site. So, I think you had to have the secret thing to mm. to get, it, but everyone is happy to give you the secret thing. Mm. I love secrets. No, I don't. Um, other topics while we're at it. Well, I say we. Call it for the official call. We all stick around as appropriate. I uh, maybe even mention when the next one is. Oh, 30. Anything else? Boom, 45 on the nose. Chris, do you want the honors? Or can both Antrenig do it maybe in harmony? Ready? Go. Like and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>